Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. Thank you for your patience. Uh, welcome to the Alice Mackay Room at the Vancouver Public Library. Hello. Uh, my name is Jorge Amigo, and I'm the head of cultural programming here at VPL. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that we are hosting this event from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh. too. And I'm an immigrant from Mexico, and therefore I'm a settler in these lands, which means I feel a special responsibility to continually learn about the ongoing effects of colonialism in this part of the world, and to bring that awareness into my work as a public servant here for your library. Um, it's great to have you all here. Uh, thank you for joining us, even though Shania Twain is playing next door. I'm sorry you had to pay so much for parking for those of you who drove. Um, who has never been here for an inside event? Okay, cool. And who's been here for, with, for more than one or two inside events? Great, okay, nice spread. So um, for those of you who've never been here, a couple of housekeeping notes. The first one is the pretty obvious one, which is please silence your cell phones. Um, you don't have to turn them off. In fact, if you keep them on and take pictures and do whatever you want on Instagram or TikTok or whatever you use. That'll be awesome. Tell people you're in a beautiful library event. Um, and so that's great, but just make sure it's not making all kinds of noises. And the second housekeeping note is that the bathrooms are located right outside this room to the right, but I'm gonna ask you to please use the door in the back, which is a little less disruptive and it makes less noise for the camera because we are uh, live streaming this event. So it'd be great if we didn't have the noise from that door on the recording. Uh, so yeah, please use that door for the bathroom. You can come in and out as many times as you want. It's not the opera, it's not the ballet. So yeah, um, as many times as you need. Um, so bef uh, I guess that's it for me. I want to introduce Leslie Herdick, who is the artistic director of the Vancouver Writers Festival, who's going to explain the event. Thank you so much, Jorge. And good evening and welcome to all of you who join us on this beautiful Vancouver evening. It's very good of you to come out and spend your night with us. And hello to everybody who is watching from home as well. It's nice to have you join us. Tonight we are honored to be working with the BC and Yukon Book Prizes to honor the shortlist of the Ethel Wilson Prize for Fiction. We would also, at the Vancouver Writers' Fest, like to acknowledge that we undertake our work on the unceded and stolen lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples, and we are very grateful to be here, also cognizant of the very important and urgent work that still needs to be undertaken as we move towards reconciliation and true Indigenous sovereignty. Thank you to our INSEP Insight Partner, the, Van uh, the Vancouver Public Library, for their collaboration and support throughout this entire season, and also to our government sponsors, and those include the Government of Canada, the BC Arts Council, the BC Government, the City of Vancouver, the, did I say the City of Vancouver? I did, and CMHC Granville Island. We really couldn't carry out the work we do without their support. And a reminder that Insight does run all the way through until Mar uh, May the 31st. And we do have two more events that we announced just today. Those include Casey Plett and Hazel Jane Plant in conversation about their newly released novels with VPL's very own Candy Tanaka. We're really excited about that one on the 17th. And then on May the 31st, we are happy to be presenting our Insight finale with award-winning writer John Valiant, who joins us with his brand new nonfiction climate reality book, Fire Weather. And he will be in conversation with CBC's Laura Lynn. Following our conversation, Billy Ray, Marion, and Danny will be available to sign books just over here, courtesy of our wonderful bookseller, Black Bond Book Warehouse. And books will also be available from the other two shortlisted authors who were unable to join us here tonight. They are Tsering Yangzom Lama and Janice Lynn Mather. 
And now I would like to introduce our three wonderful guests this evening. Billy Ray Belcourt is no stranger to our stages, as prolific as he is thoughtful. Billy Ray is a writer and an academic from the Driftpile Cree Nation. He is an assistant professor in the School of Creative Writing at the University of British Columbia, and the author of four books, including This Wound is a World, Indian Coping Mechanisms, a History of My Brief Body, and his most recent work and debut fiction, A Minor Chorus, which, as one reviewer put it, delivers incendiary reflections on the costs, scars, and power of history and community. This is a breathtaking and hypnotic achievement. Marian Ehrenberg is a psychologist, professor, and writer. She cultivated a lifelong love of literature into creative writing practice that has resulted in this debut novel. As Kirkus Reviews wrote, Ehrenberg's handling of the psychoanalysis process is expert and delicate. This is a strong character study about how people react when backed into a corner, a complex, engaging novel about temptation and ethical quandaries. And Danny Ramadan is a Syrian-Canadian author and LGBTQ refugee advocate. He is the author of the critically acclaimed Salma books for children. His novel, novel Clothesline Swing, was published to enthusiastic reviews in 2017. And now his second novel, The Foghorn Echoes, has been nominated for this award amid much praise and great review. The Foghorn Echoes is a deeply moving novel of forbidden love between two boys in war-torn Syria and the fallout that ripples through their adult lives. As The Guardian said, Ramadan weaves together these narratives to great effect and gives a vivid sense of Syria under the Assad regime. Please welcome our three nominated authors. Hello. So it's interesting when we are presented with a short list like this and we host an event that is based on that short list. Of course, we cannot expect that the five shortlisted books would have uh, equal commonalities that would allow us to have a free flowing conversation about those. So, what we're going to do tonight is a little bit different for us. We've asked each of our writers to give us a 15 minute presentation on their books. And then we're going to have a conversation after that, take a few questions from the audience and from our viewers at home, and then have a book signing after that. And before we start, though, before we start with that, I kind of wanted to quickly talk about Ethel Wilson. Who is this Ethel Wilson that this prize is named after? I did a little research because it turns out that she was writing at the turn of the last century. So none of, I, well, I shouldn't say none of us, I wasn't fully aware of all that she had done, but I'm going to tell you just a little bit quickly before we get going. Ethel Wilson was a novelist and story writer and essayist. She died in 1980, so she wrote for about 80 years. And she had a small but impressive literary output that earned her an important place in Canadian literature. She was orphaned at 10 and sent to Vancouver to live with her maternal grandmother and several aunts. And her delight and fascination with her adopted homeland permeates her work. She's one of the first Canadian writers to capture the truly rugged and unsurpassed beauty of the BC landscape. Now this next part is the part that interested me in terms of you three. Yet this strong sense of place evoked in her an unpretentious and lucid style that's never merely regional, as her characters consistently struggle with the paradox of the human condition, the intense desire for personal freedom versus the strong need for responsible and harmonious integration with others. So that was sort of interesting when I heard that about Ethel Wilson, and then I thought about each of your books. I had an aha moment, aha. There, there is a wonderful tie-in to this award and these books. And I will say also for um, Saring and Janice's books as well, it, it ties in very nicely. So with that premise in mind, we are going to go alphabetically today and start with Billy Ray. 
Hello. Maybe I should lift this up a little. Thanks for being here. I was saying it's so nice out, and there's also an Oilers game, <laughs> which is where part of my heart is right now with the Oilers. Um, always a pleasure to share the stage with uh, other writers, especially those based here in Vancouver, and to um, be to be at the library. <laughs> so thank you. I'm going to read a um, some thoughts about the novel and about novel writing more generally. And then I'll do a short reading from the book. The story I've been telling about a minor chorus starts in 2018, when at a residency in the Okanagan in the middle of a July heat wave, I set out to write a novel. Until then, my most affectively charged identification was that of a poet or a poet scholar. I had published my first book of poetry the year before and had recently sold my second. In the wave of creative freedom that arrives after a project is finished or put aside, my thoughts wandered errantly toward novels. And in parentheses, perhaps novels are containers for errant thought. I made my way into the landscape of contemporary novels, first via the postmodern, books that took as one of their objects of analysis the form of the novel itself, books that brought sustained attention to the fact that to put people inside a novel is to put them into a structure that bears, to varying degrees, traces of our own social realities. I remember making the trek to Mosaic Books in downtown Kelowna to buy Rachel Cusk's outline which was so unlike the novels I had read until then that I initially felt dizzied by its triumphant eschewal of the seductions of plot and character. I was, in the end, seduced by this denial of normative seductions. In a daze, I took to the internet, where I read the following from, a, from Cusk in a New Yorker interview. She said, Essentially, I think all the problems of writing are problems of living, and all the problems of creativity are problems of living, end quote. I immediately felt a kind of kinship with this line of inquiry. In the Okanagan, where I was mostly alone for two weeks, battling bouts of heat sickness, <laughs> I realized that I was contending with problems of living and that that contention necessarily affected my art. In other words, I wanted to change my writing practice because I wanted to change my life. A novel seemed vast and capacious enough to hold and make sense of all the ambivalences I carried inside me. To be queer and indigenous is to be at a remove from the world because the world is calibrated to bring about our suffering. This was and continues to be a thematic resonance across my books and also my writer self's conditions of possibility and impossibility. It can be easy to give yourself over to a condition of impossibility, to let it swallow you up. I understood, at first unconsciously, and then knowingly, that I had to write my way toward a possible life. In 2018, I aligned myself with what the French philosopher Roland Barthes called the fantasy of the novel, which is a fixation with the novel, not as a commodity, but as an aesthetic form for being in the world. About this fantasy, another philosopher, Rudolphus T. Uwin, writes, and I quote, it is Barthes himself who desires to be an author, and it is a classical novel that he desires to write. But this desire, as is typical with desires, is actually wrapped up in a fantasy, a fantasy of authorship. Barthes had registered within himself a tendency to write, but how does one turn this wanting to write into being a person who writes, end quote. Tiewin points out that Barthes ended up concerning himself less with actual classical texts and more so with the meta-literature of his favorite authors, preparatory, paratextual, 
non-creative writing in order to study their art of living. Novels, of course, are ultimately about the art of living. I didn't want to write a novel because I had a firm sense of what it meant to live, but precisely because I wasn't sure how to. In my memoir, I wrote a bit about my failed attempts to write a novel. For example, I wrote, one night in an empty bed, it occurred to me that, I wanted, that what I wanted wasn't to write a novel, but to fall in love. Both were overwhelmingly possible, which perhaps explains why I accomplished neither. I now understand that the desire to fall in love and the desire to write a novel are bound up in co-determining. I wanted a total transformation of my material, psychic, and creative circumstances. I at last started writing what would become a minor course in 2019 in the void between completed graduate coursework and my thesis defense. I woke up one morning feeling alienated from academia and decided to write into that sense of alienation. From there, the faint shape of a plot emerged. A graduate student, much like myself, steps away from academia in order to write a novel. He conducts a series of interviews with people in Northern Alberta, the titular minor chorus. The protagonist is, in a sense, a second copy of me, a mise en abim, which is a term I only learned today. <laughs> I buried myself into the novel in order to imbue it with urgency. What emerged, I think, is a study of the kind of histories that produce someone like me, a queer indigenous person moved to imagine otherwise conditions for his life, to imagine his way out of the violent superstructure of colonial capitalism. In inventing fictional people, in treating them honestly and compassionately, I wanted to make evident the seriousness that all kinds of indigenous people bring to the work of desiring in excess of the colonial present. Decolonization is ultimately about desire. What kind of, what kind of worlds do we desire for ourselves and one another? How do we desire shared freedom from subjugation? A novel is a long story about people desiring things. I want my work, my current and future novels, to invite people to share in the desire for another world, to want to write our way out of one story and into another more decolonial one. Okay, I'm just gonna read a short bit from the start of the novel. Thank you. It was a late afternoon at the start of August when I went to the university to meet up with River, a dear friend and graduate student in the Department of Sociology who hailed from a reserve to the South to make sense of the desire to remake my life. I wanted to leave academia. This thought, which wasn't so much intrusive as it was a response to an ongoing crisis of creativity, permeated my days. I was waiting in front of one of the oldest buildings on campus, a neoclassical hallmark of the humanities quad called Old Arts. The entrance was replete with tribute to the architecture of antiquity. On either side of the steps were pillars, and above each of those were another pair. Foliage sprawled across the facade, illuminating rather than obscuring the ornate brickwork. Because it was outside the normal academic year, there was no one else around me. The effect of all of this was that in my Cree body in the 21st century, I was a historical anomaly. On this day, I was fine with projecting my feelings of alienation onto what was so clearly a product of a longing for a heroic white past, however mythological. In fact, it felt rebellious to do so. 
Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Billy Ray. Um, gosh, that means you're up next, Mary, and yeah. Great. So right away, I'm having a flashback to my first year of teaching at UVic, at which time I had not finished my dissertation, and I was very insecure about that. And I stood behind the pulpit like this, and one of the first evaluations that I got was one of the, stu the students were saying, you know, it's going well, but you should come out from behind that pulpit. I said, no way, I'm not ready for that. So here I am again. I am so excited to be here, to be back in beautiful Vancouver on a spring evening. And I'm deeply honored to be in the company of two talented and impactful BC writers, Danny and Billy Ray. I devoured your books, and I thank you for a very substantial meal. I really enjoyed them. I also appreciate everyone who's contributed to this event and all the kind people I've been interacting with, taking care of all the details and keeping us moving in the right direction. So when I say it's lovely to be back in Vancouver is because this is where I lived as a young woman when I studied to become a psychologist. So it's truly a place that is locked into my senses, my emotions, a time of life. I remember when I arrived in Vancouver is also when I fell in love with the practice of psychotherapy and its endless possibilities for change and human transformation. In the summer before graduate school started, our, one of our professors assigned a novel called August by Judith Rosner, who is a psychiatrist. The point of reading the novel was to whet our appetite for learning all about psychotherapy in graduate school, but for me, it also ignited a desire to write fiction myself one day with psychotherapy in it. Many years later, thesis and dissertations, my own, my students, writing research papers, practice chapters, I just couldn't hold it in any longer. I engaged in a path of intensive retraining um, in creative writing, and finally, I got to write something with a plot. The language of dreams invites the reader into the private world of psychotherapy and all that might happen around it. It tells the story of the rich but blurred relationship between a psychologist and her client. Avery is a seasoned therapist in her early 40s. She's kind, she's conscientious, bit of a rule follower. On the outside, she looks like she has it all together, but that may not be the case. Enter Claire, a 22-year-old talented artist, nonconformist, angry. She's been mandated into psychotherapy by the courts for stealing, she's not pleased to find herself in Avery's waiting room. Immediately, um, Claire is motivated to sort of work with the power differential that she's really um, resentful about and to sort of find the good doctor's Achilles heel. And by the end of the session, she um, shows herself to be a thief. She steals something from the waiting room and quite an accomplished snoop in terms of finding out a lot about her therapist. Avery struggles to regain control over the therapeutic relationship. It's a roller coaster ride with many twists and turns. Claire gets under Avery's skin. When you're a psychologist and you start dreaming about your client, perhaps it's time to return to your own therapist's couch 
and so Avery does. There's several themes in the, in the book that I'll point out to you um, that I find interesting. Um, one of them is what, what lies beneath the surface, what we see on the surface versus what's really going on for a person. So I promise you, if you decide to read this book, um, you will find Claire at first to be obnoxious, rude, impossible, but then you will see that there's a lot more to her. Clients and therapists are vulnerable, and both Claire and Avery shelter deep vulnerabilities stemming from their pasts. There's also a theme of human transformation that I've thought about a great deal. How do people change? How much can people change? And how? And I've certainly learned that psychotherapy is really one, only one avenue. Um, and in my book and in my life, I explore other more nonverbal channels that may evoke change, like art, dream work, dance, and all of these figured into the writing of this novel. I'd like to read you, read you an excerpt from the perspective of Claire. In the right light at the right time, everything is extraordinary. Claire lay on her bed, bathed in the spectacular light of this night. Filtered through the slats of her Venetian blinds, the harvest moon cast playful lines of light on the naked body of her lover. There he slept beside her on a jumble of white bedsheets. She'd have to throw the entire smelly mess into the washing machine first thing in the morning. Well, this dance is definitely over, Claire thought, suppressing a chuckle. The young man's long dark hair was no longer twisted into the sexy braid he wore sitting at the bar. When she'd caught her first glimpse of him from the back, his white shirt revealing the hints of a chiseled body, she was pretty sure he'd be doing it for her by the end of the night. He now glistened with sweat and, snor and snored contentedly. Claire felt restless now that the sex was over and extracted her hand from his. She slipped out of bed and wrapped herself in the white silk robe robe she'd abandoned on the floor earlier that evening. Standing in the breeze of the balcony door, Claire soundlessly rolled up the Venetian blinds. The moonlight poured into her studio apartment, coloring it the shade of honey. Claire turned toward the bed to ensure the flood of light hadn't woken up her spent man. She padded ac barefoot across the room, opened the drawer of her desk and retrieved a faded black and white photograph. She held it close to her face, hoping to find even the tiniest detail she might have missed the other times she'd done this very same thing. There she was again, the beautiful, smiling woman caught somewhere, sometime, holding a chubby-armed little girl high over her head. It was the only photo she had of herself with her mother. Claire tried to hang on to the moment, but as always, always, this feeling of complete love faded to despondency. Maybe tonight would make a difference because the right light was finally here and she had a plan. Claire held the corner of the photograph between her pursed lips and leaned down to pick up a canvas stored under her desk. She brought it across the room to her easel and swiveled it so that it faced the moonlight. Claire felt for a pushpin in her drawer, discovering it with a prick to her finger. She affixed the photograph to the canvas frame so she could look at the painting and the photo at the same time. She had the perfect solution to her unfinished painting. Claire moved her painting stool to the side of the easel so as not to block the moonlight and sat down. Illuminated in the moonlight, the painting appeared to be in motion. Clouds floating over basil green hills and mint sea foam spraying up from the ocean. The finely articulated sea spray looked like it was catching in the clouds. 
It was the faintest whisper of a conversation with heaven, she thought to herself. A few strategically placed flickers of gold leaf glittered like water in the moonlight. She felt her edges melting as a smile blossomed on her face. It looked just like she had hoped. I think Mama would like it. The painting finally looked like that ephemeral place, that place she couldn't actually remember or locate in her waking life, but that floated past her at night in wispy dream fragments for as long as she could remember. When she was 12, Claire had heard about lucid dreamings and how to get good at it. Her plan was to soldier fully alert through her dreams, good and bad, so she could see and remember everything. She learned about foods that would help this brilliant way of dreaming like dark cherries and full fat yogurt and incantations to be spoken at bedtime, apparently necessary to build the confidence she needed to stay lucid to her dreamscapes. Claire began setting her alarm to wake her exactly four hours after she went to bed. Then she turned on the lights to write feverishly in her dream journal and then lie down to induce a second round of dreams. At this point in Claire's admittedly extremist pursuit of dreams, her adoptive parents, Molly and Jim, became worried. They sat her down one evening after dinner and asked her if she'd like to see a counselor about her dreams. She said she did not. Claire was offended by this suggestion, and she, she thought about it now. She remembered how good her parents, her adoptive parents had been to her. She had a habit of resenting them simply because they were a reminder of her real parents, one of whom had died on her and the other who had no interest in being in her life. She felt a wave of gratitude for Molly and Jim wash over her, She'd have to learn how to love them as they deserved to be. Claire remembered how one night, after her alarm went off at one in the morning, Jim came to the bedside with a thick sketch pad and a fresh set of drawing pencils. Maybe it would be easier to draw what you've seen, he suggested in his strong Scottish accent, and then padded quickly back out of the bedroom before she had time to open her mouth. That night, at 15, Claire decided to become an artist. The dream sketches flowed effortlessly from her mind's eye, unhindered by words, grammar, spelling, and exacting thoughts. The harvest moonlight would not last much longer, and it was time to unleash her uncensored self. Claire closed her eyes for a few seconds and took a deep breath before she began to paint. Checking the black and white photo, she painted a side view of her mother lying relaxed on her back on the ocean's shore, holding her little girl high, careful to capture the exact expressions on their faces, matching dimples and all. In a trance now, she filled in her mother's rose-colored blouse that smelled like lilacs in the springtime, the loose white shorts that doubled as a bathing suit for quick splashes in freezing cold ocean, and the pink and yellow dotted sundress allowing for free movement of young Claire's chubby arms and legs. Claire worked frantically to keep up with the powerful images gliding through her mind. There it was now, a simple basket perched beside mother and child that would have been filled with lemonade in a recycled glass milk bottle, egg sandwiches cut into triangles, and her teddy bear, whose name was, what was it? Yes, it was Finley. She felt tears filling her eyes at this discovery of a name to call her teddy bear. The canvas that had taken months to prepare and a lifetime of dreams to envision was finished. The moonlight had stood by her, Claire thought gratefully. She felt tears streaming down her cheeks, tears that she'd held in since that day of black and gray holding her grandmother's hand at her mother's funeral. Claire folded herself down onto the old rug. Good night, Mama. A few hours later, Claire woke to sunlight and the young man leaning over her, his long dark hair gathered into a messy man bun. I love your painting, but are you okay, beautiful? 
It took Claire a moment to gather her senses. She again felt hopeless. Last night was over. For a split second, she pictured herself cuddled into Pierre's arms and telling him about how much she missed her mother still, even 18 years later. But instead, she exploded. Get the hell out. Can't you see I want to be alone? This was not the first young man who would gather his things and get the hell out, looking like a dog who'd been kicked hard enough that he wouldn't be back. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marion. Kind of want to know more about Claire. <laughs> and thank you, Danny. All right, here we go. Hold on, I need my notes. They're on my phone. And I put my notes on. And we go, here we go. All right. Um, I usually, I'm, I'm actually, I, mm, so I don't come across as I'm terrified of stages. I come across as a very uh, extroverted person, but I usually sit there and I imagine myself the coolest person in every room. I really do, I really do. But there's someone here who's wearing sunglasses indoors, so I feel like I'm not the coolest person in this room anymore. <laughs> um, thank you so much for us. <laughs> thank you so much for hosting. You can still wear them, I'm just joking, I swear. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you so much for hosting me. I really appreciate the uh, uh, invitation from the Vancouver's Writers Festival, as well as the space offered by the Vancouver Public Library. Thank you so much. I was too terrified to write my next novel. I have had a lot of success with The Clothesline Swing. I got nominated for an a couple of awards. I got good reviews. And I felt like I need to match that same level. And that everything that I write would never be good enough. And I'll tell you a story. I was on the book tour for the, Foghorn, uh, for the Clothesline Swing back in 2018. Uh, in, a, in a town that I'm not going to name. Um, and um, somebody raised their hand at the end of the, uh, the, the, the reading and asked, what am I working on next? And I said, I'm working on a story about uh, two queer Syrian refugees uh, who fell in love in Syria and then got separated because of the civil war. And the person was like, but I have a comment, which is the scariest thing an author on a stage can ever hear. And I was like, all right. And uh, the guy was like, didn't you just write that? And I kind of lost my shit. Um, I really did, because I, I went back and I'm like, I don't think I wrote the manual when I wrote The Close Line Swing. I don't think I wrote the manual on queer Syrian refugees. I am allowed to write as many stories about queer Syrian refugees as, a, as my heart desire. And I can, at the end of the day, there are so many other writers out there who write stories about white women, and they can write a million stories about white women, and that is totally fine. But me writing a story, one single story about queer refugees, now we know everything we need to know about queer Syrian refugees. <laughs> and to be honest, like, and I continued, God knows, I continued, I lost my shit. Um, I was like, but look at everywhere, everybody. I mean, Alice Munro. Alice Munro, every single short story by Alice Munro is about an East, uh, East Coast woman who is too tired of the uh, busy life over there, so she flies here to the West Coast, uh, goes and lives in the woods, and then falls in love with a woodsman, and then they fuck for hours, and then... <laughs> And then that's the, uh, the, the intricate details of life is the, the, uh, the, and she can write a million version of those stories and I can't write two books about queer Syrian refugees. <laughs> it is terrifying to write a second novel when you are a marginalized author. It feels sometimes that here in North America, we have this, this unspoken agreement that authors are divided into two groups. You're either an author who can write well or an author who has something to write about. And we as marginalized authors are stuck in the second corner where we have something to write about. And no matter how good of an author you are, as a marginalized author who's writing something that 
they want to write about, you will never be able, very rarely you will be able to immigrate to the second group, which is authors who know how to write. And it breaks my heart, it really does, because genuinely speaking, I think that I'm a good author. I think that my, my stories, my plot lines, the way that I write is just stunningly unique and it's my own. I mean, I think Belly Ray Billcourt is an amazing author. And I think that I'm an amazing author too. I just think that we are two different unique people who are capable of writing different stories. And I think there's space for both of us to be both fantastic authors and authors who have something to write about. We can occupy both spaces. The Foghorn Echoes came to me on the, uh, at three o'clock in the morning uh, on the 17th of December, 2018. It was a foggy night in Vancouver. You can Google it. The uh, uh, Vancouver, Vancouver, now Vancouver, whatever, wrote an article about it. Um, and the foghorn was used. Now, before that, I didn't live anywhere near the, uh, the, the shore, so I've never heard uh, a foghorn in my life. And I woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning to the sound of a foghorn, which is, by the way, if you don't know what that is, it's terrifying. <laughs> it is terrifying. And the, the sound, the, 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 the fog that I'm used to is back in Damascus, the fogs of war, that there is some sort of a, like an attack or an explosion that just happened. So it's three o'clock in the morning, I wake up to the foghorn, we just live on the beach, and my, my boyfriend at the time, my husband right now, uh, wakes up to me kicking and screaming. Uh, nobody went back to bed that night, uh, everybody was, terrified in that house. He had to explain to me what a foghorn is, which if, if you know my, my friend Samantha here, if you know Matthew at three o'clock in the morning, he was not impressed by being <laughs> awake and to talk about foghorns. Um, and that morning I wrote, no idea why, I, know, I wrote this uh, scene of two queer kids on a boat um, crossing the Mediterranean and they get stuck in the fog. I didn't know who these people are. I just knew that I wanted to navigate the theme of trauma as a hidden um, crocodile in the muddy waters of our internal selves. And then these two kids walk barefoot, wade barefoot into this water and disturb the crocodiles. So I came up with the structure of a fog and its echo where the two characters are met meeting in the prologue of the book and then a specific dramatic event causes them to separate and you end up with two characters who are chronologically working through the same issues but from a logistical perspective, one is living in Vancouver and the other is living in uh, Damascus and they are moving away from each other further and further. And the only way that I can get those two characters to work together, so this is a novel that makes sense rather than two different books uh, masked as one, is for the two of them to echo each other. So the inciting incident happens like an explosion, and then one person does something, and the other respond to it, even when they're not sharing the same time and space. And that response cause an echo, which cause an echo, which cause an echo, until the whole book was structured. I drew it actually on a wall with John Vinia, you know John. So John and I, my mentor, we drew it on a wall. And I love the idea that I get to play with those two characters and show you two different responses to trauma through the uh, narrative of the book. Because it defeats the purpose of saying, didn't you just write that? I literally wrote two different stories of two queer folks who are faced with the same exact trauma and respond to it in completely two different ways. I'm going to read to you from the Foghorn Echoes, uh, and I'm going to read to you something that is completely separated and divorced from everything I just <laughs> said. <laughs> the reason why I chose this reading is because it's very joyful to me. It's a fun reading to me. And I think the, the theme of defying 
uh, stereotypes when it comes to, to writing is what I wanted to go with. So I'm going to read you something that might start very stressful, but I promise you has a very interesting ending. Uh, so bear with me. Is that okay with everyone? All right. So I'm also going to read from the end of the book, which is blasphemy for an author. <laughs> But so I'm not going to tell you who's talking, which of the two characters is talking. All you need to know is that this character is leaving Aleppo, which is a city of Dam in Damascus, and trying to cross the borders legally to Turkey to become a refugee in Turkey. Are we all in? Great. Yes. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, I'm on time even. Wow. All right. The taxi driver asked if I was escaping military service, and I told him that I was an only child. You're a lucky one, he said. You're the only one who won't be called in in these times. You never know, I said from the back seat. You never know, he repeated. There were three of us in the car, myself, the driver, and his friend in the front. They told me that the trip won't be long, and especially since I was legally leaving Syria with my passport, there wouldn't be any trouble at the border. We passed the windy streets of Aleppo quickly, leaving behind the heavy shilling noise in eastern neighborhood neighborhoods. With every explosion, I jumped in the back seat, while both the driver and his friend nonchalantly continued their conversation. On our way out of the city, we're saluted by its dimly lit citadel, the fortress made of stones too large for a dozen men to carry, had survived 2,000 years and hundreds of wars. It looked abandoned, save for a large Syrian flag and a tower-tall picture of Bashar al-Assad. Hours later, we neared the Turkish border. We parked in the short line, in the long line of cars leaving the country, some empty except for a passenger or two, other packed to the roof with luggage. The line stretched for miles ahead of us, and the driver and his friend left the car to smoke. I heard a ringtone coming from inside the car. I lowered the window and told the driver that his phone was ringing. He flashed me his phone in his hand, and before I could say more, the ringing stopped. By the time we reached the border check, the sun had already risen and dryness filled my mouth. The driver's friend had fallen asleep while the driver smoked yet another cigarette, puffing the smoke through his open window. He elbowed his friend awake and they handed their documents to the officer to leave through. Where is Malik? The driver asked. I thought this was his shift. Malik is sick today, the officer responded. He looked at me through the window and I handed him my passport. He looked at it and then at my face. He lifted the passport up to examine in the di direct sunlight and then he bent it. I thought he might bite it next to ensure its authenticity, but he finally handed it back. The driver was about to start the engine again, but the officer asked him to open the trunk. Malik never asks us to open the trunk. The, his voice was steady. I am not Malik. Now open the trunk. The driver exchanged a look with his friend before he pulled the lever by his side and the trunk unlocked. What's going on? I whispered to them. The driver hushed me while following the officer with his eyes. We are fucked. His friend nodded in agreement. It finally dawned on me that someone was hiding in the trunk. That is where the ringtone had come from. The officer pulled the trunk open. Seconds passed. My fingers trembled, and I felt a tightness in my stomach. You brought this on me, I said to the driver and his friend, and they hushed me in unison. A few seconds passed. Then the officer closed the trunk, tapped on it twice, and ordered us to drive away. The driver, not believing his ears, hit the road fast, leaving a cloud of dust behind. I wanted to look back, but he shouted at me to keep my face forward. We drove for 10 minutes in silence until the border disappeared behind us. And then he parked on the side of the road and the three of us jumped out of the car. Together, we opened the trunk. Inside was the smuggled man. He was drunk. 
the driver explained to me that the man was due to join military service to fight on the front lines, not wanting to be part of the war and knowing well that his name was on the no travel list, he had no option but to be smuggled. The man broke into fits of laughter and stank of whiskey. He told us that using the flashlight on his phone, he had found a box containing four bottles of whiskey stashed back there. Uh, nothing to do but to drink. The man shielded his eyes from the harsh sun. He had guzzled the alcohol on an empty stomach and had passed out until the officer opened the trunk. We both froze, he told us, without thinking. He had handed a full whiskey bottle to the officer. The officer looked at the bottle and back at the man, then slashed the bottle and closed the trunk. <laughs> the funny part is, the man said, I can't tell if I gave him the bottle filled with alcohol or the one I drank and then filled with my own piss. <laughs> now, one last note, I read this not three days ago in Iceland, and somebody, as I was getting off the stage, hugged me and said, thank you so much for sharing your life story with us. That was very courageous. Thank you. Thank you so much, Danny, and thank you again to all three of you for those presentations. Uh, it really made me want to go back and revisit your books again, and Marion, of course, your book as well. And I guess, you know, going back to this prize, this Ethel Wilson Prize, and the fact that each of you have based your these titles in some reality from your lives, what is it about fiction? Why choose fiction to tell the stories that you want to tell? Billy Ray, I know you write in many genres, and you've both written essays, of course, but what is it about fiction? I'll start quickly. I'll just say it makes me think of a tweet I saw where someone was like, I love autofiction because you, could just, you just get to lie about yourself. <laughs> um, <laughs> and yeah, so I, I you know, get a similar response to my novel as, as I think Danny gets, which is some people will assume that the protagonist is me, which is not the case, as I said in the talk, it's sort of this like, um, alternate version of me that I sort of situated into a context that is actual, which is Northern Alberta, um, dealing with themes that are real, uh, but amidst people that I've invented. And I think fiction, I, I needed to, I can only tell the story I wanted to tell about police violence and incarceration through fiction because I knew that there's just too much at stake um, when it's about, you know, an actual living life. And so fiction allowed me the ability to, um, or gave me the, the ability to um, tackle our social reality um, with the kind of um, creative freedom that meant that, um, sort of no one's reputation <laughs> was at stake. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and do you, ha have you come to the point ever where you've needed to almost defend the fact that that book is fiction and to push back and say, this isn't me, this is, yeah. yeah. It's hard to say, because again, to go back to Rachel Cusk, she has, a, she has a thing where she said, part of the reason why she wrote Outline the way she did, which as I said in the talk is without that sharpest sense of character, is said because she said that she was, um, she felt embarrassed by how often novelists had to uh, defend themselves and say that it's not real. Because she, in her mind, she's like, all fiction is real to varying degrees. Mm -hmm. It all, you know, we draw on something, we, uh, we can't, we can't draw on, we can't sort of invent everything. Um, and so, yeah, so I feel ambivalent about it because on the one hand, no, it's not me, no, these people aren't real, but on the other hand, you know, this context is incredibly real and, you know, I'm, I'm drawing from, you know, all the, the memories and the experiences that make up my life to this point. Mm -hmm. Marion, I suspect some of that resonates with you, with your career, 
Why, why did you choose fiction, or what was it about yeah. that genre? Um, there it is. Is that on? Yeah. Um, I get the same kind of questions about whether it's autobiographical, and readers might say, are you Avery? And I'm confidently able to say, no, but I know her very well. Um, and um, uh, what I hope is, and I think that fiction, by engaging um, the readers in an interesting story and being able to take things to extremes, like blurring of boundaries, for example, is um, interesting. And I think it's just um, easier to um, absorb and still offers, however, what's really important to me is an authentic rendition of uh, mental health and what happens in, in therapy and themes of what clients are going through. Um, and there too, my, uh, there, I don't have a client like Claire, I've never had a client like Claire, but there are different um, themes and, and pieces of characters that I've woven together into, into a whole um, so that I can confidently speak about that character and their internal world, but also um, be respectful to all the clients that I have seen and who inspire me and who I respect deeply. So fiction allows me to do that. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, that was real. I was the drunk guy. In the <laughs> drunk guy. <laughs> um, no, I joke, of course. Um, so, fiction is quite easy to me. I have been writing fiction since I was 14, and I, I feel like I'm a fiction writer. Writing short stories and novels just feel like the, the right thing to me. Um, and it feels like it has been my shield and my, my bedding for so long. Whenever I'm, I need comfort, I go into my fiction. Whenever I feel like the world is just too much, I, I hide behind my fiction. So it feels very comforting to me, honestly. So, um, and I, I just read, uh, finished writing my memoir. It comes out next year. Uh -huh. um, That's which exciting. Felt, which A sent me back to therapy, um, <laughs> as, as it should. It, it really did, yeah, yeah. My, my husband was not impressed that I was writing a memoir. Um, and, and B, it, it really showed me the pathways where my brain goes to find my real life stories and experiences and then filter it and mix it together and mush it together and then create fiction. It really invited me to those dark corners that I wasn't comfortable going to and that my fiction was my way into. Um, and I think writing the memoir would make me a better fiction writer in the future. In a way, writing that memoir opened me up to be able to, to understand myself better and, and therefore have more empathy towards my characters as I'm going to write more fiction in the future. Um, which is, so I'm, I, I literally just finished writing the memoir not a month ago and I'm already writing my next novel just because of how fiction feels like comfort and how the memoir had helped me re-access fiction that way. Yeah, that's quite wonderful and, and exciting to hear about the memoir. The memoir. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, soon we are going to turn it over to you for some questions, so um, maybe percolate on those a bit, you at home as well. Um, I did want to ask about literary awards. Um, specifically right now about this one, a regional award, a award that's given out in British Columbia and Yukon, um, and what that means to you, but potentially a little more controversial. <laughs> I'm curious to know what you think of the wider world of literary awards, and um, yeah, what that means to each of you. It's a tricky question. It's very <laughs> tricky. <laughs> Controversy. Yes. It's scandalo. Um, <laughs> it's a drag race reference for anybody. Um, yes. Um, all right. I'm going to say it. 
so I was invited by my UK publisher to go to go to London uh, so we can schmooze with the jury that uh, comes up with the long list for the booker. And it feels like the Oscars over there. Like you have to schmooze and you have to buy wine and go out and shake hands and smile and, and talk. And did not feel, genuinely speaking, did not feel like the merit of the book was on the, on the, uh, on the line here. What felt like is um, how cool can I present myself, which did not sit with, with me well at all. Um, and that takes me back to the conversation I was having a minute ago, which is I'm not, I'm not an author, I'm not here and being published and this is my second novel and I have books and children books because I have something, just because I have something to write about. It is also because I genuinely believe, authentically believe, and a bit delusionally believe <laughs> that I am a fantastic author, <laughs> right? And I, I think we all have to have that delusional tendency to, to, to judge up ourselves. Um, and that's why I'm, I'm genuinely very excited about the BC and Yukon uh, uh, Book Awards because it mm -hmm. feels like it is, A, it's coming from a community that I call home. Uh, I've come to this, to this land in 2014. Uh, I became Canadian in 2019 and now I'm nominated to an award that is from within Canada, from this land, and it, it feels wonderful to be nominated in this. Uh, as well as it feels the award I did not schmooze anybody <laughs> for this award. <laughs> Nobody this needed to This is authentic. Be this is real. <laughs> this is yeah. just because I'm a pretty goddamn good writer. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Amongst other fantastic authors. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Do you want to delve into that one, either of you? Sure. Um, well, for me, um, this is my first novel. And it was a really interesting experience for me to sort of break into a whole other world, which at times, to be very honest with you, um, I experienced as um, exclusive, um, that you had to know people, um, lots of uh, hurry up and, and wait, and I tired of all that. And so I decided to get really good mentors and to write this novel, and for my first novel, to publish it independently. So it was, that's a hard road um, because it doesn't follow tradition, which is really a funny thing for a university professor to say because it's, there's so much tradition there. So for me, um, these, this award in particular was an opportunity to break out of this lonely place of when you're in your head and you're writing your novel and to put it forward uh, with trust, there's many, um, there's many awards that will not allow an independently published book to be submitted, which I think is kind of biased. Um, so it was a, you know, just amazing for me and super encouraging um, to be shortlisted for this award. Um, and it has felt very um, genuine and it makes me believe that really this award is open to all kinds of writers and is not circumscript to just a, you know, a select few. So that, that's my early experience of awards. Yeah. yeah, thank you for that perspective. That's, that's great. Yeah, I'll just echo that. I think, you know, the original words, they feel special because they're, you're, you're receiving recognition from your peers from your community that you live in and work in. And um, what I love is the opportunity to be in conversation that these sort of kind of prizes make possible um, because we don't always get to be in conversation. And um, it's hard because it's one of those, like, you know, awards are hard not to desire. <laughs> uh, you know, recognition is something that we, you know, we all desire. And so as long, I think, as we hold on to an understanding that we receive recognition from a whole sort of array of places, that, that feels to me like a sort of a healthier approach. Because um, I think someone, someone said this, that if you, know, if, you await for, if you wait for specific kinds of recognition, you could be waiting your whole life. 
So. Uh, yeah, good point. Good point too. Do we have any questions from the audience tonight? I've got a few here on the iPad coming from viewers at home, but can, do we want to kick it off in person or shall I go to the, oh, yes. Thank you for sharing your experience with lightning. Mm -hmm. My question is when you write and select characters, do you consider the age of the characters? Because I'm a curator and creator of one character on festival, and when, when I tell them I do no disturbance with elderly people, the first question they ask me is, is it all about dementia? And I said, no. It's all about comedy, multi-generational comedy. Mm. So when you were talking about <coughs> you are two kinds of authors, so you are, so the impression people have of elderly people is dementia. And my second question is, what do you think of what's happening in Florida? Where okay, um, I, you're looking directly at me. I'm no, sorry. The question my is to everyone? Yeah. Okay. Maybe I'll just summarize your question too. So I think it's a question for everyone about creating character and um, uh, how do you add in characters who are senior without um, you know, making it cliche or perhaps like stereotyped, is that correct? And then your second question, which may be a little less clear to me is, what do you think of what's going on in Florida? Are we talking politically in Florida? Yeah. yeah. That's a, that's a big, big question. <laughs> but let's start with that first one. Yeah, I could quickly just jump into that first question because um, in my fiction, I, I, there are a lot of cookums, grandmothers. And yeah, <laughs> partly, you know, partly because you know, I was raised by my cookum, my grandmother. And I have you know, just like a deep love for her. And of course, that would sort of come into my work, uh, especially in the fiction, because you know, because of that closeness, I feel like I can render that kind of character well and honestly, and authentically. And yeah, you know, when you sit down to write, when I sit down to write, I should say, you know, I just always end up with the cookum, <laughs> uh, and yeah, I, I don't, I don't try to suppress that. I'm going to echo that. You're talking to two queer authors of color. Of course, our elderly <laughs> mothers and grandmothers feature in our fiction. Um, yes, I have a lot of characters that are um, elder in uh, the, 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 both the Foghorn Echoes and the Clothesline Swing. The Clothesline Swing actually is a story of lo two elder lovers, uh, queer lovers who, are, who have been together for 50 plus years. Uh, that is the, the premise of the story, and they share um, their history back and forth to keep their history alive, so that is how the storytelling is happening in the clothesline swing. Um, as for the Foghorn Echoes, one of the main conflicts is between uh, one of my main characters, which is who's uh, uh, in his late 20s, and his much older uh, boyfriend, who is in his late 60s. So the dynamic between the two is uh, very important on the page. So um, as, as um, Billy Ray uh, said, we do have a lot of characters of elder wise women in, in our fiction, both of us, but also I do believe in representing the queer experience, not just as the uh, hard, um, like muscular, cisgender, young man that, that will look great on the cover. Um, and I write, read those books. Those books are a lot of fun, but <laughs> I don't write those books. Yes. Um, I, I also include um, older adults um, in my story, and I will continue to do that. And I try to strike a balance. Certainly, you know, you don't want to put forward, you know, stereotypes of age groups. Those, those characters don't even feel real, and I, you know, and I don't. I would object to what that is saying. But I try to also be um, authentic to the place of. Um, memory loss and trauma. So in my story, there is one, um, there is a parent who is losing her memory and this, and it's really a bit more about how that impacts 
the people around her and how they they miss her and how they you know try to help her help her with that. Um, so I I think it's really important to have a really a full range of characters and different <coughs> age ranges. Um, what do I think about what's happening in Florida? I'll jump to that. I think it's awful, right? <laughs> I think it's awful, and uh, I think there's a lot of things that awful that are you know happening across the border, but here, but here too, you know, censoring people like Margaret Atwood, like, come on. Um, but I, what I love here, what I've noticed in bookstores is these tables for, you know, the banned books. These are the books that have been banned and I, I love the irreverence of that and the uh, unwillingness to be um, controlled, at least to some extent, by uh, government by politics to again for kids you know who are LGBTQ and having all kinds of experiences I think it's horrific really to remove books where they can see themselves in the books so it's bad I think it's bad <laughs> it's very bad I'm gonna take a question now from one of our viewers at home um, this is an interesting question. How do you decide what to read at events, and is it different for different events? I'm pretty improvisational. I have some certain certain sections that I'll rely on, but sometimes I just switch it up and see where my hand goes What's when I'm at the podium. Like? Yeah. yeah. I train like I train in front of my mirror. I train like mad. I come up with voices. I study my hand movement. I'm very specific of what I. It's a whole thing. It's and you. If you took a video of me doing what I did, what I just did in Iceland, and what I just did here, it, it will be very hard to find differences. <laughs> it's it's, um, yeah. It's 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 a lot of. Work for I also come from about when I was uh, um, in uh, university. I did a lot of theater, so it just feels it f it feels like that. I me. think that shines <laughs> through in your readings, which is always appreciated. Yeah. Thank you. Um, well, I haven't done that many readings, but the ones that I've done have been varied, um, so depending on the audience. I also am quite empathic, and I can imagine. You know that if you've been to an event and then I read the same thing, you know, might be a, you might not enjoy that. Um, so depending on the event, so this to me is a um, a more uh, I, I, here I really focused on character and sort of a literary account of character. In other settings, I focused on more the plot line and the action and tried to pick interesting pieces out from there. And I too practice and I time myself, and I highlight, so I don't think that's ever going to go away. <laughs> it's good to be prepared. The Edmontonian in me wants to ask Billy Ray what the score of the hockey game <laughs> is. <laughs> um, but it. also, do we have any more questions from the audience? Okay, I have one more on my iPad. What, we're what, down by one. What it's, period is it? It's 3-2 at the, near the end of the second. It's not bad. There's still Could be hope. worse. Could There's be still worse. hope, folks. <laughs> yes, a question here. Um, you guys have both said about with auto fiction, it's often not you know a one to one representation of yourself or of your life, but more you know an alternate self with like a similar context, things like that. Um, when you find yourself writing about characters, you know who maybe reflect LGBTQ humanity and people throughout your life, do you ever struggle with worrying about you know what if someone reads your book and they? I'm just going to repeat that question back for the viewers at home. It's a question about when you're writing character, do you struggle with revealing too much about someone you know in person, a loved one or a person who has been in your life either currently or in the past? Um, maybe the ethics of that or how it feels to reveal secrets or otherwise. My best friend sitting there was like, me, for example. <laughs> me. Yes. Um, gosh. I, I think I dilute the characters quite a lot. Um, and then I mix and match, and then I add uh, some of myself into the character. And, and it just it feels, 
it feels very divorced from the the uh, the the seed of inspiration for each character. I don't think that unless I name them by name or tell them to their face, I don't think anybody would be able to tell that that's uh, them in my fiction. Actually, that's a lie. There's one specific person, <coughs> there's one specific person who is a person that I genuinely dislike, uh, who always appears <laughs> as a villain in my books. <laughs> They're every villain in my book. Their first letter of the name is an R, so if you ever read my fiction, that is the person that I genuinely dislike a lot, and that person always ends up in my, in my fiction. Yeah, yeah. Will they be in your memoir is the question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look for the R. <laughs> Marian? Um, I, yes, I think that is a struggle. I stay far away, as far away as possible from, re, uh, you know, individuals that I know or that I, I've known professionally. Um, but I allow their experiences and what they've shared to inform my development of really amalgamate kind of um, a character. So I would never want a client to read my book and somehow, you know, think that I had written about them. Although I will tell you it does happen no matter how careful you are. I had the briefest reference where the psychologist says, Paul, please come in. And one of my clients said to me, is that, is that me? <laughs> <laughs> I said, if you want it to be, it could be. And that's, that's the last that's spoken of this character. So it does happen. People are, are interested. But I stay far away from that myself. Yeah, people will sort of impose themselves yeah. onto the work. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, that as authors we can't do anything about. But um, I think yeah, for me when I was writing my memoir, I, I was really careful about what I wrote because I knew that I wasn't going to be able to have the kind of conversations with certain family members if I were to write about certain things that would be ethically necessary. So I thought, well, I'll just write about myself then, and I'll sort of I'll leave all you know that's their story. Um, I won't go there. And um, so, you know, my memoir uh, is mostly about my early 20s or sort of my early, te you know, adulthood because um, that's what I felt most ethically um, allowed to do. And then with the fiction, it's like, yeah, you sort of, as I said earlier, you're drawn your whole human experience to date and the experience of being in the world at our time in, in history. And um, you write about, I write about structures. And so, um, it's maybe you know easier to, to write about those structures without implicating others. I don't know. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Yeah. We are coming to the end of this wonderful discussion, um, but I do want to say these five books, which have been nominated, and all of the other category of awards that are being offered by the BC and Yukon Book Prizes, um, will come to fruition in September when one person will be given the award in each category. And I just want to say good luck to all three of you and to our two authors who couldn't join us this evening. It was a real pleasure to get to speak with you here tonight to hear a bit more about your books. Uh, great thanks to the BC and Yukon Book Prizes and to the Vancouver Public Library for working with us on our Insight events and this event here tonight. And thank you to all of you for joining us at home and here. The sun is still up <laughs> and the Oilers can still win. <laughs> so <laughs> buy a book or three or five, get them signed and then go enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining. I have a brief outro note for you. Um, since uh, we have a bunch of other events coming up soon, so I just want to give you a quick uh, list. Uh, we just recently kicked off our Upliftation series at the library, which celebrates uh, Asian cultures and perspectives and serves to push back against anti-Asian racism in our communities. And so the next event is right here on the stage on Monday the 8th. We're hosting a conversation about Henry Tsang's new book, White Riot, 
which is a collection of essays and photographs about the 1907 anti-Asian riots that happened all over Vancouver, but also all over BC. So he's going to be chatting with anti-Chinatown gentrification activists Melody Ma and Karin Ng. And then two days later on Wednesday the 10th, we're hosting an author talk with Kevin Chong about his new novel, The Double Life of Benson Yu. He's going to be chatting with J.J. Lee. Yeah. And uh, of course, Insight is back here in exactly two weeks on Wednesday, uh, May 17th. And there'll be, that'll be a conversation with the wonderful Casey Plett and Hazel Jane Plant, um, moderated by Candy Tanaka. So uh, lots to look forward to. And as Leslie said, go out, enjoy the sun uh, before the sunset, and go see a hockey game if that's what you want to do. <laughs> see ya.